YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. This is Danielle Hayden with the Hayden Group and Keller Williams Ann Arbor. Welcome to our channel. We are so excited to have, we're blessed really, to sit here with Rachel Massey. She is one of our local appraisers. Her business name is Massey and Associates Valuation Services. Did I get that right? You sure did. Yay! Winner, winner, <laughs> chicken dinner. Okay, so we are here with Rachel today. We're going to talk to you about a few things. We're going to talk about the basics of appraisal. We're going to talk about it from the viewpoint of what you need to know as an agent for new agents that are watching, what you need to know as a consumer, whether you're buying or selling, and a few of the main tenets to just keep in mind when you're forming this idea of what is the appraisal. We're also going to talk about where Rachel uh, does it appraisals here uh, in the local area and how you can get a hold of her as well. Um, so stay tuned. And you know what? If you like more information jam-packed like this into your little videos, subscribe and please toggle that little bell so you get instant notification when the Hayden Group uploads yet another informational video just for you. Thanks so much. Welcome back. We are so excited to dig into the word appraisal with who better than our local appraisal expert, Rachel Massey of Massey and Associates Valuation Services. Hi, Rachel. How are you today? Good, Danielle. Good. We're thrilled to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe how you got into the business. Okay, absolutely. So I have been practicing appraiser now for 30 plus years. I'm a local appraiser, meaning Washtenaw County, mm -hmm. and I do cover the edges of mm -hmm. Jackson County and Livingston County. So I cover Manchester, Chelsea, Dexter, Saline, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti. Can I, let's pause there because I want to point out, she doesn't just cover those areas, she knows them. And we'll get into a little bit of why that's important, right? Like. You have to have an appraiser that actually knows the local landscape. That is very, very true. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit more about me. I've been appraising now for 30 years. I sold real estate for five years before I became an appraiser. So mm -hmm. I do understand what buyers um, what buyers are looking for because really appraisals are based on mm -hmm. buyers' actions in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, I, I use PAP instructor. USPAP is the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal. That's what we all live mm -hmm. by. And I'm a designated appraiser with both the Appraisal Institute as well as the American Society of Appraisers. Awesome. So for those of you who don't know Rachel, her, her reputation precedes her. Everyone mm -hmm. in the industry really knows Rachel and she's come uh, to speak to us in our market center and for our board multiple times and she's just a wealth of information. So we're going to dig right into it. So tell us if you could define, let's say for the average consumer, what an appraisal is, what would you tell them? Well, I would tell them I would like to go to the definition of what an appraisal is. And this is actually really important. This is right from the definition in use path. And that is an appraisal is the act or process of developing an opinion of value. It is an opinion of value. Mm -hmm. And an appraisal is numerically expressed as a specific number. Okay. As a range of numbers. Mm -hmm. Or as a relationship, meaning it's not more than, it's not less than, to a previous opinion of value. Okay. So it's a benchmark. Mm -hmm. And it always has to be numerically expressed, even if it's a range. So that's what an appraisal is. Okay, so it could come back as a number and it could come back as a range, depending on what kind of appraisal is being done. Correct? Absolutely. So if you have somebody who is getting an appraisal because they want to buy a house and they're not comfortable with what they're paying, they could say, you know, I just want to know if it's in the range. Okay, so in this situation, we're talking about maybe a buyer who's not working with a financial institution. Correct. So if someone's buying cash and they want to order an appraisal, that would be a situation where the appraisal gets ordered directly between Absolutely. the consumer and the appraisal company. Absolutely. And then in other situations, it's actually the bank that orders the appraisal, right? For financing, the bank orders the appraisal. Okay, so if you if you are using financing and you have a loan officer, just be aware that that appraisal is actually ordered by the bank and the communication happens between the bank and the appraiser, not the consumer and not the real estate agent. And really it's there to protect the bank in that situation, right? Absolutely, and that goes to the three C's, which are the credit, capacity, and collateral. Okay. So on a mortgage loan, 
credit is obviously payment history from the borrower. Okay. And the capacity is whether they can actually pay back the loan. This is in simple terms. So like debt to income ratio, things right. like that. And what their yes, what their income is. Mm -hmm. And the the collateral, which is my part of it, the appraiser's part of it, is where the lender orders that appraisal mm -hmm. and they are responsible for it and that's not something that the buyer or the seller or the real estate agents are privy to. So even though the borrower is paying for the appraisal through the lending process, mm -hmm. it's not their appraisal, the appraiser still has a duty of care but the client is the lender. So, so does the appraiser have any duty of care towards the consumer that's buying the house in that situation? Or are they just a third party that's actually paying for the fee so the bank can order it? They are the third party paying the fee that there is no communication with the appraiser. They, you have some communication, but you cannot tread into confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Confidentiality being things such as the assignment results. What did it appraise for? The appraiser can't tell. The mm -hmm. consumer that now the lender is going to give the appraisal to the borrower right and they're gonna they're gonna actually even provide the report to, to the mm -hmm. borrower so it's not like they're just gonna make up a number they're gonna tell you right now I have a question for you mm -hmm. why is this so important not just to the transaction but to society We've been through a lot of ups and downs in the last we you know two decades <laughs> have. we certainly have. The appraisal, when it is completed, based on the definition of an appraiser, and I'm going to stop and quote what the definition of is an appraiser is because this is really important. Okay. So that is one who's expected to perform valuation services competently and in a manner that is independent, impartial, and objective. Ooh, independent, impartial, and objective. And objective. And do, you know what this means? <laughs> do you know what this means? Agents, do you know what this means? This means you are not to call and sway an appraiser. Thank you. <laughs> that is not what you're supposed to do. No. Um, and most of the time, if you try to, you will get a door in your face because it is unethical and it is completely against what the object of the appraisal is, which is an objective viewpoint. Absolutely. So we are really the one party in a transaction that has nothing to gain from the loan closing. Mm -hmm. We have nothing to lose from the loan closing. Mm -hmm. We're objective. It doesn't matter. What we're looking for is support for our opinions. Mm -hmm. Now what happens if you do get an appraised value and I know we were in a situation a few years ago where the market was overheating to the point where consumers were willing to pay over and above what the property was then appraising for because you have to remember uh, purchase agreements and offers they have more to do with active inventory than past solds but appraisals need past solds as evidence to be able to justify a value. And so this is where you have a meeting of the minds and sometimes they don't meet in the same place. <laughs> they don't. Um, and so I'm just curious, back then we were in a situation where the consumers were sort of inflating the purchase prices and appraisals had to catch up. They didn't just make that leap overnight. Correct. What resources or paths do exist if people feel, you know what, I just really feel like there are some comps out there that weren't used and I feel like the appraisal valuation could have come back higher. So what Danielle is asking about is called a reconsideration of value. Okay. And that is perfectly acceptable. It's allowed under interagency guidelines as a uh, method to actually bring forward these comparables or something that you think that is missed. Now, I shouldn't say comparables. They're sales. It's the appraiser who decides whether they're comparable or not. Ah, oh, okay. So, for instance, if I'm doing an appraisal on a subdivision house, sales on 10 acres 20 miles away, they may be sales, but they're not going to be comparable. Mm -hmm. What are some criteria that you can outline for us? I know I have my way of doing CMAs, and I think I'm pretty accurate, <laughs> uh, but, but in a CMA, it's a comparative market analysis. This is a tool that real estate professionals often use to help try to kind of predict what an appraised value will be for a property because it's no, there's no interest for us in having our clients hang out at a price point that we know is not going to hold water in the appraisal. It's against my client's best interest in that case. Absolutely. So we do have a CMA or a comparative market analysis and I have my method 
what would you suggest if there's a consumer out there or a real estate agent who's learning how to do a CMA? Do you have a, a simple sort of step-by-step -step method that they could start with? Well, the real estate agent's really going to be looking mostly at the sales and what's on the market. You want as similar as possible. Mm -hmm. So you want something that would really be the alternative for the buyer. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at what the buyer's choices are. And it is unlikely that if you have a thousand square foot subject that a 2,000 square foot house is comparable. Mm -hmm. So you're looking, if you have a thousand square foot house, you're probably looking between 800 and 1200 square feet. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it has to be really comparable. Uh, if it's a 50 year old house, you're not really wanting to look at 20 year old houses. Mm -hmm. It's trying to keep it similar. Location is always important. Style is important. Mm -hmm. Condition is important. Mm -hmm. So all of those elements, but really you want to stay as close as possible to the property and recent. Mm -hmm. So if the appraisal uses sales that are all proximate, they're recent, and they're really similar to the subject property, and it doesn't appraise at sales price, and the realtor provides sales that are up here, and they're really dissimilar, mm -hmm. and they're old, mm -hmm. they're going to get shot down. Well, and that doesn't that uh, often a reconsideration is going to cost additional money, right, on the part of the consumer? Or no, no, it shouldn't. Okay, so well, that's good to know. No, it shouldn't cost anything. But what will happen on a reconsideration of value is that the consumer, through their real estate agent, most likely will put together a few sales, and most lenders limit it to three. Don't bring forward more than three sales mm -hmm. that you think are better than the ones that are in the appraisal report. You'll have to say why you think that they're better than the ones in the appraisal report. Mm -hmm. Then the reviewer at the mortgage lender will look at it and say, well, yes, I can see that these actually have some merit, mm -hmm. and that's when it goes on to the appraisal. Now, more often than not, the lender's reviewer is going to look at it and go, you know, these are older. They're you're more grasping. Distant. Yeah, you're really grasping. Mm -hmm. And they'll just deny it there. So it never even goes back to the appraiser. But sometimes, I don't know what the percentage is, but I think it's probably somewhere around 10, 15 percent of the time. They have some, there's really some cause. And that happens when an appraiser has looked at the MLS in a market area with maybe too narrow an, a, a focus mm -hmm. and so they just miss something and it's innocent well and and one thing that i have seen especially in areas that are a little more rural or a little more far removed and they have less data i have seen um i have seen realtors or appraisers who aren't familiar with the area they will pick what they feel is the most similar, but they didn't realize that if they had gone back just one or two more months, right. they would have actually seen a comp. Um, so again, really right. important to have people who are specialists in the area. Now, because a lot of consumers will not be choosing you, they'll go to a bank mm -hmm. and the bank will choose an appraiser. How can they safeguard against getting a non-local appraiser pick? The lender is going to be responsible for picking the appraiser. The lender will have gone through the vetting process. If they haven't gone through the vetting process, they'll hire an appraisal management company that will have gone through the vetting process. So the consumer, the only uh, way that the consumer has any influence on the appraisal is by choosing their lender carefully. Do you feel in your experience that choosing a particular type of lender is more likely to get them a local appraiser? Local lenders usually. There you go, local lenders. I didn't wanna say it myself because <laughs> if I hear somebody else say it, I know it must be fact, right? Yeah. yeah, it's generally local lenders that have control of their own panel. I want to cover this detail because one of the things I really appreciate about you is you send out emails constantly to agents to either ask you to, you ask us to take surveys mm -hmm. so that we can help you inform unique situations and get an idea of what buyers might be thinking, but you also send us market data in return, which I find really, really helpful. Yeah. So let's talk about this recent uh, market report that you sent okay. out. 
I want to know what were your general findings about the current 2020 spring market? Um, I do what's called a contract to listing ratio. The realtors are very familiar with it. I've been doing one iteration or another of it since 1992. So I kind of got my finger on this one. Mm -hmm. And the contract to listing ratio is basically taking the pool of listings mm -hmm. that are on the market in a given area. Mm -hmm. How many of them are listed? How many of those listings are under contract? So once we hit 35%, it's my magic number, once we hit 35% of those properties under contract, it means we've shifted into a seller's market. If we're less than 20%, 20% or below, we're in a buyer's market. And anywhere in between is kind of in between. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, we do have balanced markets. We have, it shifts all the time. Mm -hmm. Right now we have just an incredible inventory crisis, I would call it, an inventory crisis. We have nothing on the market. Can I share something about that? Yes. I have got about 30 transactions in my pipeline for 2020, and half of them are buyers, the other half are sellers, but about half of those sellers are also looking to buy. So I've got about 75% of those 30 transactions sitting there waiting, and we have no homes to show them. Right. Not a single home that fits our criteria. And we have this huge, huge pent up supply for people who want to sell, but they're afraid to put their house on the market until they can find something. So they're in a cash 22. Yes, I have a lot of clients that are feeling that squeeze as well. Right, because if I put my house on the market today and I sell it and I can't find anything, then I'm out on the street and I have, right. to, I have to arrange temporary housing, it's gonna cost me a whole bunch of money. The only thing I've thought of as an agent that could help give some reprieve to that is going under contract for a very long contract period and, uh, and awarding your buyers long inspection contingency periods mm -hmm. so that you can then spend a month and a half looking without your buyer having to fork out money for an inspection or an appraisal. But it's still really dicey because if something falls apart after that point, then, then you've got to start way back from square one. It's, Absolutely. It's a little difficult right now. It is scary. It's I was recently on a listing appointment with a gentleman and he, uh, he wants to list his property way above what I would recommend. Way, 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 way. And I explained to him, well, I, I appreciate that, sir. And it's my responsibility as your fiduciary to inform you that it will not appraise. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no real value in us hanging out on the market at a spot where it's not gonna appraise anyways. We might as well lower it, catch all the relevant and appropriate buyers, pit them against one another and see if the price will drive up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and he told me, well, why do I care about an appraisal, right? So let's talk about this idea of like going for the oddball fish who won't get an appraisal. I mean, do you, have you ever heard this before? Yes, yeah, sometimes you have the oddball fish who won't get an appraisal. You'll see that most likely on lakefront properties. Okay. They're just so odd that somebody just has to have it and they're going to ignore an appraisal. Also, we have a lot of Real property waivers, those are from lenders. If you have 20% down or more, you might not need an appraisal. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, they might get somebody who doesn't have an appraisal. Um, the vast majority still get appraisals. One of the things that I told him, and I'm sorry, but I love this line for people who, I because I don't know, I feel like this is an industry based a lot on evidence and on being fiscally responsible, <laughs> right? And, and so I told him, I said, Sir, if someone has half a million dollars cash lying around that they're going to spend on this home, they're probably very fiscally educated and responsible and probably won't invest half a million dollars without getting an appraisal or yes. at least knowing it's a fair price. Right. Like, you know, that 95% of the time, I think people are gonna expect an appraisal. So if you're one of those eyeballs out there, tisk tisk. <laughs> I really think you should rethink your strategy. <laughs> and, and buyers do hire appraisers to tell them what they think that the value is. And then the buyer, the consumer, is an informed decision maker. Whether they go through and buy at some outrageous price or not, at least they know. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I think maybe would be uh, important for any of our new agents and our buyers out there to know, or even our sellers, the condition of the home can sometimes dictate 
whether or not it will get flagged in appraisal, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got the inspection, which is something the consumer opts into and the consumer pays for, and they have a professional come through and inspect the quality and condition of all the parts of the home. And then you have the appraisal, and some people call it the appraisal inspection. These are not the same thing. Are These not. are different. There are some things that could potentially get flagged in certain appraisals. And so what are those? What loan programs do they pertain to? And how do we best set our people up for success? Okay, so the broader conventional financing, which is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, look for safety, soundness, and security. Mm -hmm. So that means that you can't have broken steps, that you're gonna, somebody's gonna trip and fall and break their neck. That's gonna be a repair that needs to be done. That would be where you have the deck that is elevated 10 feet above the ground and there's rotted deck boards. Those are gonna to have to be repaired. Mm -hmm. So this is a safety issue. Mm -hmm. um, another sound uh, safety issue would be things such as, um, what do you call them, security locks on windows that then you can't get out of if there's a fire. Oh, okay. Uh, that is also something that is going to be looked for. Um, a leaking roof. Okay. That, that won't go for Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac either. Mm -hmm. FHA is going to be much tighter on what's required. And they, those are Federal Housing Administration and, or other words, government-backed loans. Correct. Okay. And VA as well. So mm -hmm. the FHA looks at the property as if the buyer is going to default on it the day they close. So what is it that needs to be done to make it marketable? So that's the way they're looking at it. And now the VA is also tough, but the VA is looking at it as providing something safe for their for veteran. Our veteran. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at it the same way, but differently because mm -hmm. the VA really wants the veteran to succeed. So they want everything fixed for the veteran. Right, so I've noticed as an agent, I've noticed that with VA, obviously you have your pest inspection and your water testing, but I've noticed that grading issues are a bigger deal with VA loans. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's because water is the number one enemy of a home. And if you've got grading issues, it's gonna be water coming in constantly to the foundation. Um, and I really respect that, that they mm -hmm. have those tighter rules. Um, and then for FHA, of course, the, the pain in our tissues as homeowners and as realtors is gonna be peeling, flaking, paint. chipped paint. Absolutely. Exposed wood and any kind of peeling paint. It's, it's so common, especially here in Michigan where you've got all those seasons, it's very, very common, but it'll kill your FHA loan right then and there. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? I don't do the FHA loans. Oh, okay, so. then I'll talk about it a little bit. <laughs> you talk about so, it. Um, so they're going to assume, especially if it was built before 1978, they're going to assume that there's lead in the paint, um, and the testing can be a little more expensive to find out whether there is or is not lead in the paint, but um, they make the assumption there is. And also exposed wood would also just come back to the water issue. Mm -hmm. So if you have exposed wood on your home and it was not meant to be exposed, it's just going to sit there and rot when it's exposed to the elements. So that will kill the deal right then and there. So if you're looking to sell your home, you might want to take a look around and see what needs to be fixed up and prepared for the market because you don't want to lose all your FHA and VA buyers if you can help it. One thing, I, even though I don't appraised for FHA. I do know that they require the appraiser to turn on the dishwasher, the stove, make sure everything is working, run the water. Mm -hmm. So if you have a vacant house that you've turned the water off on, that's going to need to be turned on for the FHA. Uh, that's appraiser. really interesting. I've never heard of that before. So that's, that's good to know. Um, Okay, fantastic. And then conventional, pretty much anything goes as long as you don't step on a board and fall through it or have broken doors where you can right. just get right into the property. And that whole window leakage, or not window leakage, the, the roof, roof leakage. leakage. Yeah, everybody's very concerned about water damage. All right, let's talk about the M word. Mold. Mold. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, you it's very difficult to actually say whether or not it's mold but if you have water damage that has gone untreated and there is now discoloration on either the wood, in the attic, on the walls, you would have to test for it, which can be expensive and you'd have to remediate. So this is something that would either get paid through an escrow account if the parties can come into, um, into agreement on it and get paid after closing, or the seller has to have the funds to just get it done. Sometimes contractors I notice will go ahead and um, 
contractors will do the work and they get paid at closing. They'll sort of be able to put a lien on the house. Whether they do or not is their own business practice, but they can put a lien on the house and then get paid at closing. But in that case, if it doesn't close, the contractor is taking on a risk. It's not all about mortgages. Yep, <laughs> We've been talking true. about mortgages, mm -hmm. but there's a myriad of reasons that a consumer might want to get an appraisal, and I have my list. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about pre-listing, which is perfect for your seller mm -hmm. who says, I don't care about an appraisal. Well, sometimes agents hire me to do an appraisal and just have kind of be the reality, the voice of reality, and the seller may say, I don't care. Mm -hmm. It's up to them. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who wants to pay cash for a house, and mm -hmm. they want to make sure that they're just not overpaying too much. Mm -hmm. Price negotiations. They might make the deal contingent on getting an appraisal or two appraisals, one from the buyer's side and one from the seller's side. Mm -hmm. We do that a lot for for sale by owners. Okay. Um, equitable distribution of assets. That's when you're dividing up the house for the divorce, assets for a divorce or, or partnership and that type of thing. Okay. There's partnership dissolution. That mm -hmm. happens. Trusts and estates. Mm -hmm. I do lots of appraisals for trusts mm -hmm. and for estates. Bankruptcy filings. Because sometimes they can keep the property, the home, in a, a bankruptcy. Oh. So they need to know what it is. Uh, relocation buyout. So the, the relocation company will do the appraisal. But that's another one that's not in mortgage realm. Litigation for damages, such as that mold that you were talking about. What if you had mold? Whether what would it affect? How would it affect the value of the property? Mm -hmm. So that's a diminution of value appraisal, and that's kind of complex. But appraisers can handle that. We can handle anything. Um, we'll just charge you for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Speaking of, I mean, what what are some rates? Um, well, I start at $500, mm -hmm. so, and I go up from there. So it's basically complexity. If it's a pretty straightforward house, it's a $500 fee. Okay. And uh, lakefront properties pretty much all start at $750 and go up, depending on what okay. I've got. Because I've yet to see a, a non-complex lake property. Okay. So it just depends on what I'm dealing with. So I can charge by the hour, which tends to be more expensive. So if I'm working with an attorney and it's litigation, it will be a by the hour job. Gotcha, so, gotcha, okay. Uh, we also do tax rebuttals. You get that tax bill and you're like, oh my God, it went up 30%. Well, you can hire an appraiser to do the work. Nice. But again, appraisers are neutral mm -hmm. and they're never gonna take a direction of value. So they're just gonna tell you what they think it is and it might not be to your benefit. Mm -hmm. If it's not to your benefit, you just throw it out. Yeah, you just pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> just, you don't need to share it. If if somebody hires an appraiser to do the appraisal, if you hired me to do an appraisal, you don't have to share it with anybody. You can look at it, go, well, this is rubbish, and throw it out. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, hey, look at world, I got this appraisal. So I think it's important when people hire an appraiser, and this is when you're not doing it through a mortgage, but you can hire somebody, is to ask questions. Ask the appraiser, what's their experience? What's your experience in the area and with the type of property mm -hmm. and the type of appraisal? So I do a lot of relocation work. It's very different than an appraisal for a mortgage because a relocation appraisal is anticipated sales price as opposed to mortgage market value. Mm -hmm. Anticipated sales price is taking today and looking forward. What's mm -hmm. it gonna sell for within the next 120 days as opposed to market value is looking back at what has sold. Now that's a game changer because if you're in an upward trending market, that can make a huge difference in your price point. Exactly. So you might actually project that the market's going to go up 5% in the next three months. And then you're going to make what's called a forecasting adjustment to bring it up. Okay. All so, right. so not only the type of appraisal, but the appraiser's reputation. Ask people, what do you know about that appraiser? Mm -hmm. uh, you can look on Google and you can see reviews on appraisers, uh, credentials, what their credentials are. And credentials are things like the uh, certifications that they've got. And we all have basic certifications, but have you gone to the extent of getting designated? Because mm -hmm. designations take a lot of time and energy. Mm -hmm. And that just shows that the appraiser really cares about their profession and has gone be, uh, above and beyond. Right. Um, recommendations. I always tell people to ask their agents ask attorneys, ask other appraisers, recommend, give me some recommendations of if you can't do it, who can? Mm -hmm. And you'll get a couple names that will come up over and again, and those are the people you hire. 
I think that's the key too. The names, you've got to cast a wide enough net to get multiple names. And when you hear the same name two, three times, that's it. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of good appraisers out there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the agents will know and the attorneys and other appraisers will know. Yeah. Three A's. How do people get a hold of you if they would like to learn more about your services? Well, they can find me on the web. Okay. And they can find me at uh, www. AnnArborAppraisals.com. Ooh, did Ooh. you get that one early? <laughs> yes. Yeah, she hacked on that one. <laughs> AnnArborAppraisals.com or uh, my phone number is 734-761-3065. And my email is R-A-C-H-M-A-S-S -S at Comcast.net. Well, thank you so much for coming You're today. Welcome. I really thank appreciated you. having time with you and getting to share that with everyone who's watching. This was watching. a pleasure. I hope everybody found this interesting. So if you like content just like this, you want to become well uh, informed about the buying and selling process and about appraisals and other of our vendor partners, please click the link below, like this video, subscribe, toggle the little bell so that you get instant notifications next time we do a video just like this. I'd also encourage you to go ahead and go below in the comment section and let us know if you have any questions or if you have comments, what you liked about the video, what you want to learn more about. All of that is important in helping us design the content that goes on this channel. Rachel, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. We will talk to you all soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.